started, it's my real pleasure to introduce Gil Holder from, the, um, from University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. I've known Gil for a long time. It feels like since we were kids, although we were beginning postdocs. So I think, kids. <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, I'm getting to that stage where it's like we were kids. Um, so Gil got his bachelor's and master's degrees from Queen's University in Ontario, and then um, went on to the University of Chicago for his PhD. and. Um, from there, went to the Institute for Advanced Study um, as a tech fellow um, and a member. Um, that's where we met. And um, after that, he moved to a faculty position in McGill. He was, for many years, a professor at McGill. And two years ago, he moved to uh, Urbana-Champaign as the Brent and Monica Fortner Chair of Astrophysics. So um, Gil is a theoretical astrophysicist and cosmologist. He's worked on the CMB, on galaxy clusters, um, on lensing, um, and um, he is going to tell us about wide field millimeter uh, wave surveys today. Thank you. Could someone move the projector? Thank you. Sure, we should move the projector. Maybe just in case. No, it's fine. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a kid anymore. Um, okay, so it's nice to visit. It's good to see, I see a lot of familiar faces from back when we were kids. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, so the title's Wide Field Millimeter Wave Surveys, but as you see, as you see, it's a little bit of a bait and switch. It's actually a talk about CMB surveys that just have a different name, but I thought people didn't want to hear about the CMB. Um, so mainly I'm going to talk about, instead of the actual classic cosmic microwave background science, some of the other things that come along when you make these really deep measurements of the microwave sky. And so um, in general, so we're going to see that it actually touches on a whole host of astrophysical uh, phenomena, much well beyond just measuring, you know, getting another digit of precision on omega bh squared. All right, so here's my outline. So I'm going to start by just you know, seeing, saying what I mean exactly by millimeter wave surveys. And then I'm just going to go through various things that people have done with these millimeter wave surveys. So just sort of, uh, I'll show you some examples of uh, things. Well, there won't really be much. You know, galaxy clusters, millimeter wave, star forming galaxies, which Dan Maroney has actually done a huge amount of work on. Um, and I see now that Brenda's doing a whole bunch of work on that, wherever she is. Um, but uh, transients is something that is, is now something we realize is uh, something that CMB surveys should be thinking about. Um, solar system bodies turn out to be things that we will be measuring. Uh, we're doing gravitational lensing maps that are nicely complementary to shear maps. And then also we can do the physics of the early universe. Um, you know, just want to make it clear that we're not done with that yet. Okay, so just to orient you, so here's a spectrum of the universe. So this is new I nu versus frequency. And this is basically the you know various backgrounds. And this is something I think of as the resource curse. And you see this big bump up here is the cosmic microwave background. And what this means is that people doing sort of cosmology and things like that in the microwave, so somewhere in here, have mainly just been thinking about all the rich physics you can do with the cosmic microwave background itself. Now, as experiments have gotten more and more sensitive, though, you see that if you start measuring this with increasingly high precision, eventually you're going to start digging into <coughs> radio sources or infrared sources. So once you're doing very high precision work, you have to start actually worrying about these other things. And historically, these are just went under the name of backgrounds or foregrounds, and were things that you just tried to get rid of and remove from your map and throw away. And so what's been discovered is that it's actually, there's real information in there um, that should be getting looked at. So to orient you, when I talk about millimeter wave surveys, so here's kind of the spectrum. So this is the classic unit for CMB sensitivity is micro K arc minute. So it's the RMS noise in, a micro, in an arc minute uh, pixel in micro K um, versus the beam size. And depending on what people have been trying to do, and so I've colored the size of the spot has something to do with roughly how much sky it's covering. So W map is out here. So what you see is a W map had a you know fairly poor resolution um, and was not super sensitive, but it did the whole sky. 
And so that allowed them to do lots of things. So Planck improved the resolution and became more sensitive, again, over the whole sky. But the mean size is somewhere out here of five arc minutes. And so you can see you're pushing down. So this means you're getting more and more sensitive to the CMB. Now, bicep Keck, so that was the, you know, they are the leaders right now in terms of just raw sensitivity on the sky. So you can see that they're mainly focused on these very large <coughs> angles. And they're just trying to get super deep because they're going after the B modes from inflation. And so they're pushing down here, and they continue to just keep on pushing down. This was pu you know, published as of a year ago. I think they've pushed it down since then. Um, now you see there's a whole cluster of things over here, which are the sort of larger aperture things. So there's SPT, and then SPT pole is deeper, and then 3G is the generation camera that's on SPT now. It's the South Pole Telescope. The Atacama Cosmology Telescope has gone through the same kind of set of uh, iterations. And then there's Simon's Array. Um, but when you look at all these things, you see it's getting more sensitive, but these lines right here are starting to constant flux for an unresolved source. And so you see that as, you get, as you're pushing down, you're pushing down to uh, fainter and fa fainter source counts in a way that when people are doing WMAP or even Planck, um, you're getting into a new regime of sources in here where you're actually starting to see astrophysics going on. And so mainly what I'm going to talk about is all the interesting things that are down here. Once you have a high enough resolution and you're deep enough to start seeing things. Okay, so now here's actually a breakdown of the citations to the South Pole Telescope paper. So I work on South Pole Telescope, so if I'm neglecting your favorite experiment because I have some intrinsic bias. Um, so only 38% of the citations to the South Pole Telescope are actually cosmology papers. So it was built as a cosmology experiment. But you see that actually there's an equal fraction that, that are on galaxy clusters. And then you see this wedge up here are submillimeter galaxies, which were not even on the radar when this experiment was built. Um, and so as surveys get deeper, I'm not sh I think this wedge is probably going to get thinner this way and fatter in this direction here. Um, and I'll just explain to you why it is that all these people are looking at these maps. So here's an example of some CMB maps. So here's a chunk of sky that's 30 square degrees from SBT pole. So that's the polar perimeter on the South Pole Telescope. And all this diffuse splotchy stuff is the cosmic microwave background. And that's what WMAP was built to see and Planck did it better. Um, and you see all this splotchy stuff and that's really interesting. But you also see, especially if you can filter the map, so here's a zoom in on this chunk right here but you can even see it in the raw map. You see these bright spots? At least the people in the front row can see the bright spots. And then there's some dark spots. So these dark spots are spots where there's um, hot electrons in galaxy clusters, and they're, they're upscattering CMB photons. That's the thermal synagogal Dovich effect. And it shows up at 150 gigahertz as a hole in the sky. So this, these dots right here are clusters at something like a redshift of 1 that are many times 10 to the 14 solar masses. So these are the most massive, some of the most massive clusters around at a redshift of around one. And all these dots are galaxies that are emissive in the microwave for various reasons. So they're either synchrotron sources or dusty sources. So just to give you a sense of what those holes in the sky are, here are two of these holes. So this is actually one that was discovered with ACT. Um, so we actually saw it in the South Pole Telescope data long before it was published with ACT, and I actually used this cluster, this cluster won a very expensive bet for me. Um, so, but this is something, it's 310 to the 15 solar masses at a redshift of 0.9. And this is, so they called it El Gordo, so that was Felipe Mananto uh, gave it its name. Um, here's an X, these are both X-ray images. Here's an X-ray image of the Phoenix cluster, which is one that we saw. That one's, you know, also quite large at a redshift of 0.6. It's forming stars at something like 750 solar masses per year in the central galaxy, which is really high. Um, and so uh, what do people do with this? Well, so for one, you just get a big list of clusters, and you do all the things that you might want to do with lists of clusters, like you could do cosmology. And so this is one of the reasons with SBT we were trying to assemble this. Um, but it's really interesting because you know this is pretty high redshift for something that's this big. Um, and so it's a very interesting way to get a, a high redshift, high mass cluster. And the way it's selected is by how many, how many electrons are there to scatter the CMB. And so that's just basically means you're selecting by total electron thermal energy. So it's this interesting way to select 
which is not, um, say, how many galaxies are there, which is what you think a galaxy cluster might be. Um, so it gives you a different bias. And so just to give you an example of what you would do with this, so for instance, uh, this paper came out, I think, last week. And so this was the, you know, this is a combination of uh, the dark energy survey with these galaxy clusters selected with SVT and F. And this is just a stack of the galaxy density as a function of radius. So this is just the surface density of galaxies as a function of radius, and it's averaged over a large number of clusters. And um, so what you see here are two different samples. This one here is the optically selected clusters. These are these microwave selected clusters. And what you see is you see they, they have this inflection point out here. So this inflection point is what's known as the splashback radius, and has something to do with figuring out you know things fall in, and they go out to the other side, and then they oscillate back and forth. And when they did the same survey in the optical, what you find is that it's actually slightly offset from where you expect it to be. With the SC sample, there's this very slight shift, um, but it's telling you that optically selected clusters are not the same as SC selection. So it, it sort of opens up some new physics you can do. But that's not what I'm mainly going to talk about. So there are dusty star forming galaxies. So those are what some of those dots are. So this is what Dan has no doubt told you all about. Um, and so here's just a snapshot of some of these dusty galaxies. So some of those little bright spots in the map. If you take ALMA and you zoom in, you take ALMA and you get a high resolution map. This isn't even the high resolution map. This was just the first resolution map we got. But you see they're all horribly distended. And that's all because they're gravitationally lensed. And so what we've discovered is that we have a very efficient way to discover gravitational lenses. So you we did the CMB survey. And what we got out of it was a sample of something like 100 strong lenses, give or take. Um, so ACT has done the same thing. So they also have a sample that should be a bunch of strong lenses. Um, Herschel has done it as well. And so it opens up some new science. So you say, well, now that we have a bunch of these strong lenses, what can we do? Um, so what got me interested in this, well, I was interested in it for a long time, but I think the most, uh, for me, the most interesting application of this is that here's the cartoon of gravitational lensing where it comes out here and gets bent. Um, but imagine if your dark matter halo has, all, has some little spots in it like this, you know, say dwarf galaxies or something like that. Well, if one of these dwarf galaxies happens to fall very close to one of these particular images, that'll distort your image ever so slightly. Um, and what that allows you to do is detect the presence of something like this dot right here because this image won't quite look right compared to the images over here. Um, so we've used that to actually look for substructure in the lens. So we did it with SDP81, um, which was a Herschel selected galaxy. And basically what we did is, so this is a sort of an artist rendition of, the, of what the mass distribution is, is we found there's that in order to map this ALMA data, so this is the ALMA image of one of those bright spots. So you take one of those little dots that SPT saw, you know, in that map, there was one bright pixel. You zoom in with ALMA, and it looks like this. It will look like this. So this, you know, we're done with Herschel, but ours will look the same way. And um, you do this high resolution map, and in order to map this very fine scale structure in the ALMA image, you can only do it if there's a little bit of extra granulation in the mass at that one spot. So it's a way to map out substructure in the lens and maybe get after missing satellites or whether there's structure along the line of sight or something like that. All right, so that'll be good for stuff. Now, but if you just in general look at the whole spectrum of all those little dots, so you have these unresolved galaxies and you say, well, what can we do with that? Well, how many are there is the first thing you ask. So it depends on your resolution. So with SPT, um, so with the South Pole Telescope, our source counts are here in black. And so what you see is we see roughly one per square degree at our resolution and our sensitivity for our original survey is one total per square degree. And that's made up of a bunch of different populations. You, so you get these, you basically have a galaxy sample and you say, okay, well, let's just see what we've got. And so they break into a few different types. So these red ones right here, almost all of them, not all of them, but a large fraction of them we think are strongly lensed. So here's an example of one of them. So this is a real image of a galaxy. So that's, uh, that's an Einstein ring. <laughs> now you see why they're called Einstein rings. Um, I mean, that's a pretty nice one. 
Um, and so that's what this population is out here. That's the, these red ones. Um, this blue sample right here is something that we've been done almost nothing with. And we, they're actually more numerous than our strong lenses at this bright end. And what these are are blazars. So these are basically AGN that are, have their jets pointed straight at us. And so we've cataloged them. We have a list of them, and we can tell you how many there are. Um, but so here's the model for how many there should be. And this blue is telling you how many we think we see. So maybe there's an excess, maybe there's not. Um, but what's interesting about these is that, so here's sort of the animation that I stole. And notice the credit for this is from Ice Cube. And so what this means is we actually have and I'll get to it later in the talk, but we actually have sort of very long baseline monitoring at fairly high time resolution of, um, you know, this is one per square degree. So we have basically like a thousand of these blazars that we're just watching all the time that we could tell you exactly what they're doing. Are they hiccuping? What are the statistics of their outflows? And so when some event happens, like let's say you get a high energy neutrino coming from one of these blazars, in principle, we have a sky record of this. Now with SPT, you would think, so Ice Cube is at the South Pole, and the South Pole Telescope is also at the South Pole, <laughs> and you would think that those two would be perfect, but it actually turns out that um, Ice Cube really prefers to see things coming through the Earth rather than things coming down from above. So it turns out the South Pole Telescope is not quite the right instrument um, for this complementarity. What you really want is something more like in Chile. Um, where they can see it at slightly higher elevation. So the sweet spot is sort of stuff that's equatorial. Um, so with ACT, this will be really good for this, or with CMBS4. But it's still worth looking into, because they do have some sensitivity, even, at the side, even for the things that are straight overhead. Um, so as you go deeper, though, what you see is you see there's a population in here, which is just the unlensed population. And this unlensed population is something that um, is only now sort of starting to get explored because even a couple of these red ones are, are looking like they're not lensed. And so Dan can tell you all about these ones. Um, they're super interesting. Um, so you see that there's sort of this, all this source science where we have all these things that we're seeing. We, and right now, we just write them down and we set them down. Um, but there's science to be done. And it's only going to get better. So you see, um, well, I'll get there. We'll get. There'll be more. OK, so now here's what I'm talking about, how there's time information. So here's this great video of the South Pole Telescope doing its survey. So this is taken by the Bicep Winter Rover. So you can actually download this, and it has some cheesy music that goes along with it. Um, so this thing right here mm -hmm. is, is the moon. And you see there's our telescope. And so this sky dips. And it's just going back and forth. So this has been sped up fairly substantially, as you could probably guess. Um, we're just surveying back and forth over the whole sky. And this is basically what the telescope does um, you know, for more than six months, just scanning back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and if you look at what, what we have, so what, it's basically typically 90, 150, 220 gigahertz, so three channels, so three microwave colors. Um, Stokes, so now it's Stokes IQ and U, so we don't have circular polarization, but Stokes IQ and U, typical resolution of one to two arc minutes. Just surveying back and forth, back and forth for many, many months at a time over whatever field we're looking at. So the current sort of where things are going for the state of the art, so our current camera is several square degrees. Um, so the Simons Observatory, which is kind of the design for going forward for CMBS4, the instantaneous field of view, we're looking, it gets measured in degrees. So we have this degree across field, you know, several degree across field of view. Um, it's sampling at 100 hertz, roughly speaking. And, you know, maybe it's more, maybe it's less, depends on the experiment. So this is sort of just for general CMB experiments in general. So if you think about what that is, um, you know, it's, you know, 100 times per second. So for things like even FRBs, so it turns out that if FR, so these fast radio bursts, so these millisecond long things, well, you say, well, it's a millisecond long and we only have 100 hertz sampling, but we're pretty sensitive. So if, you, if FRBs have a flat spectrum, then actually we should have FRBs in our data. Now, there's, we haven't found any. This guy, Nick Carrington, who's a grad student at Berkeley, was looking for them, didn't see anything obvious. Um, 
And then, so that's the fastest, right? We have sort of a few square degrees at a time scale of 100 hertz. Now, we scan back and forth for a while. So you go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then eventually that, that pixel you're scanning across is, is no longer in the field of view. So what does that mean? Well, that means you effectively get a few minutes of observation, and that'll depend on the experiment. So sometimes it'll be, you know, it could be as low as two minutes, it could be as long as maybe 20 minutes. Um, and in that set of observations, you can get somewhere around 10 milligenes. So, and that's sort of a roughly daily cadence. So it depends on the details of the experiment, you know, exactly what these numbers are and where they're going to be depends on the experiment, but the numbers are sort of some number of milligenesmes per day with roughly daily coverage. And again, it depends on whether you're at the pole or whether you're in Chile. So you have roughly daily coverage, several milligenesmes. Within the, each of those days, you have kind of a 20-minute baseline. And at any one time, you could have something like <coughs> 400 hertz. So there's this wide range in times in there that is, um, you know, like Milijansky is a unit that astronomers use, right? It's not Megajansky. Um, so with SBT pole, for instance, um, we went back. So this was led by uh, Nathan Whitehorn and Tyler Natoli. So they went back and so went through sort of archival SBT data and said, um, well, if you just look sort of from day to day, did the sky change? And lo and behold, what was found is that there was an object that on, uh, you know, for a few day period around April 11th, it sure looks like some object appeared. And then if I made another difference, you would see it's gone again. Some object just went and then flared and went away. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't realize this, so this paper is 1604, and you see this date is 2013. So those don't match, and so it means that we couldn't say, could someone else look and see if you see something? So instead, you go back through the alerts, and what we found is that no one saw anything in particular at that spot in the sky. That's not a spot where there's an AGN. Um, so there's no natural reason that that spot should have flared. We have no idea what it is. We have no idea, we have no way of ever knowing. Um, but what it has done is it's motivated sort of um, a real-time analysis. So that this is something that Nathan Whitehorn is funded to do. He's doing a real-time analysis where he can get the time stream comes off the telescope and can post an alert um, basically on the fly. <coughs> now, the reason that, you know, so the funny thing about this is that it turns out there's a lot of pixels on the sky. <laughs> And so the raw significance of this thing is something like eight sigma or something like that. But by the time you say, okay, well, how many pixels did you look at? How many different time scales did you look at? Um, by the time you do all those sort of look elsewhere effects, is what they call them in particle physics, it ends up being a 1% chance of a fluke. And that was a number where we said 1%, but that sure doesn't sound very likely. But on the other hand, 1% is not zero. So, um, but. You know, with the this was done with SPT pole with SPT 3G, uh, we should be even more sensitive. So if stuff like this is happening regularly, um, so within a year or so, we should actually have a pipeline that can sort of drag these alerts out. So there's some time domain astronomy that we can do. So yep. you, what is the duration of this? I mean, what could you this say? This was about, about four days. Oh, it it stayed on for. Four it was days. on for about four days. I think that's maybe the ha half width of it or something like that. So yeah, it came on and stayed on for a few days and then faded. And so it had some really weird polarization properties. So we have polarization, right, it's IQEU. So we saw that it was strongly linear polarized. The polarization flipped over the course of a few days. It started one polarization, it flipped to a different one. So it's, it's, it's not at all obvious what it is. It also has a rising spectrum, um, not a falling, so it doesn't seem like it's optically thin synchrotron, but um, you know, so we have no idea what it is, <laughs> uh, but there's clearly a chance that there's some weird things going on in the sky. So what could it be? Well, so you know, you look around and you say, w what goes off? Um, so there are long, there are GRBs, so gamma ray bursts. There are long gamma ray bursts, and the way those, you know, typically they get triggered in the gamma rays, and then people will swivel their telescope to look at whichever ones they feel like looking at. Um, 
And so here is a com compilation from 2012. This was right before Alma turned on, although Alma has not actually looked at very many. So Karma has a bunch of new ones, which I didn't put up here. Um, but this is, so this is a rough sensitivity of the next generation CMB experiments, CMB stage four. And you see that, you know, of the ones that people bothered to look at, there's a whole bunch of them at 90 gigahertz that actually would be seen with a CMB, with the next generation CMB experiment. Um, so there is stuff to be seen. So we should see some long gamma ray bursts. Now locally, there's been a bunch of other things going on. So f here's um, a, a, another gamma ray burst. And this is the first ALMA light curve. And this is from you know, 1808. This is the first ALMA light curve of a gamma ray burst. And so what you see is you see there's some dots. And then there's some theory models that go through. There's a you know, FS means there's a forward shock. RS means there's a reverse shock. And you see this thing is going way up. So what's interesting about this is that um, you know, here's this Milijansky, which I told you was a real unit, right? Um, and this is days, which is one day. So that's about the time it'll take for a CMB experiment to get onto this. And maybe we won't quite get to one Milijansky in that day, but there's some large number of points that we're going to get to within a few hours. Right? Remember the way this thing works is that we do some bit and then we move on. At any one time, you have you know, instantaneous coverage of several degrees on a side, which means you actually have a non-zero chance of actually getting a gamma ray burst going off in your field while you're looking that um, you could see what's going on. Um, so just to orient you, so I don't know what unit to use, but if you take one Milijansky at a redshift of about 0.2, so that's what I'm saying is kind of where the CMB sensitivity will crap out, that corresponds to something like 10 to the 41 ergs per second. So that's a lot, right? The sun's 10 to the 33. Um, so something that, that came out more recently, so you know, AT, 2018 cow um, was a very luminous millimeter transient. We actually have no idea what this, at least I have no idea what this thing is. Um, but here's its, this is again ALMA, 230 gigahertz. Um, what are you seeing? Well, you're seeing that this thing is, uh, you know, tens of Milijansky in the, mic in the millimeter. Uh, and what that's saying is that this is something that, uh, you know, when this thing goes off, we'll have coverage, again, this is days since it happened, we'll have coverage on this light curve, you know, with sensitivity that kind of starts down here, um, off the left edge of your plot. So whenever you're off the left edge of a theory plot, that means you're doing something interesting, right? Um, or off the right. It's just not interesting when you're off the top of it. Um, so there's something to be done in there. Now, how I got into this business, surprisingly, um, you know, so transients were never re really my thing. Like, I don't know if Demetrios remembers. When I first arrived as a postdoc, I actually knew nothing about any astronomy at all. And he actually would take me aside for remedial education for about half an hour a day, where we'd go on a blackboard and he'd sort of lead me through what the basic terms of astronomy are. Um, so I got started in this because I, you know, I was at McGill before this, and there was this, you know, this issue of uh, whether there was missing mass in the solar system. So, um, you know, so this is what Mike Brown was called Planet Nine, and so you know maybe it's there. You know, people argue about whether it's actually there or not, um, but the idea is that there's something, there could be something out there which which is kind of shepherding the orbits of some of these TNOs, um, and it is consistent with something being out here that has a mass, who knows what it is, maybe it's five Earth masses, maybe it's 15 Earth masses, and it's at a distance, several hundred AU, give or take. Um, so something that looks like this. And um, so at the time it came out, I thought, planets, like how could there be a planet out there that we haven't seen? Because in CMB world, we actually calibrate off planets. So if there's a planet out there, how are we missing a calibrator out in the sky? And it does turn out there's a lot of sky out there. That sort of was my first lesson, is how much sky there is. Um, but just to orient you, so you know, this is a little high. This is 300 gigahertz instead of 150. But just you know, thermal emission at millimeter wavelengths. So a typical temperature of something that's several Earth masses is going to be at least 40K. 
And the reason it's going to be at least 40K is because if it's closer, it's, you know, the solar heating will be above that. Once you get much beyond sort of Pluto, um, it should have just the radiogenic heat should make it, if, as long as it's a few Earth masses, just radiogenic heating should keep it at at least 40 Kelvin. Just the fact, you, you know, as long as there's rocks in there and they're decaying, that should be enough to keep it at at least 40 Kelvin. So you stick it out at 700 AU, and the flux is 30 millijanskis. And so you're well into the Rayleigh genes. So when you're doing this measurement in a CMB measure, you know, it's a CMB experiment, which is going after something which is 3 Kelvin. So you're way into the Rayleigh genes, so it just goes linear with the temperature. Um, so these things are pretty bright, and it's just a question of who has looked in the right spots in the sky. Now, it turns out that most surveys have not actually yet looked in the right part of the sky. Um, so here was our first hack at this, where we just basically said, OK, well, first of all, who could see this? Just saying, what's the flux of, say, planet 9? Um, and it depends on its distance. So this is parallax down here. So your dominant mode to detecting this is by seeing it just wiggle back and forth in the sky just from parallax. Um, and you see the parallax of this thing should be something like 5 arc minutes. Maybe seven or minutes. Let me look at the number. Hang on. And it's just moving back and forth. Um, and so you need to have a beam that can resolve that. And so the problem is that we have this great ex survey called Planck, uh, which should have been able to see it, except that it's just barely unresolved. This is the resolution limit of Planck. And so what it means is that over the course of the Planck survey, it wouldn't have moved enough to have been seen. So it would just look like a point source, and there are a bunch of things in the sky that would show up as a not very bright right up at the limit of Planck sensitivity. So Planck, I wouldn't expect to be able to see it. Um, SPT or ACT are CMB surveys that have been going for a while, and it should be easy. This thing should be on fire, and you should see it moving back and forth. And the only problem with SPT, so SPT is at the South Pole, which means it doesn't see very much of, of anything close to the ecliptic. Um, and ACT surveyed an area which turns out to be in the wrong direction for most of where Planet 9 would have to be sort of in order to have its orbit out there. Um, now what we also realized is that actually with proposed instruments, well, so first of all, there's a big gap in here. And then second of all, with stuff like CMBS-4, there's a whole bunch of discovery space out here. So what that says, and so what I take this to mean is, well, Maybe Planet 9 is there, maybe it's not. Um, but if there's anything out there, it actually is, could be discovered in a CMB survey before it's discovered in some other survey. And that got me thinking about, OK, well, what else is out there? And I never really thought very much about our solar system before. Um, so here's the same kind of plot, except now it's the expected flux at various wavelengths. So. Um, Blue means at 220 gigahertz, red means 150, black means 90. Um, here's the distance from us, well, distance from the sun, I guess. Um, so what you see right here, these are the main belt asteroids. And you actually see, and so this is their flux at 150 gigahertz. And I've just kind of, the size of the dot is just basically the, the radius of this. So you see like Ceres is up there. Um, you see there's a whole ton of asteroids that are actually going to be the thermal emission is going to get measured with uh, future CMB instruments. And some of them are going to be measured at extremely high signal noise, you know, signal noise of 1,000. So at a signal noise of 1,000, you actually can see these things rotate. You know, these things have rotation periods. Remember, we're surveying for, you know, several minutes every day. If you fold on that rotation curve, you see that these are all known objects. So we're not going to discover new objects this way, but, but so these are known objects. A lot of them have known rotation periods. You just fold on that, or you measure the rotation period, and you can start doing things like looking at the, you know this you know what the shape of these things are and things like that. Um, out here, these are the sort of the dwarf planets. So that's Pluto up there uh, at different frequencies, and so you can see there's dwarf planets. So any any new dwarf planets out to something like 100 AU. So there's the noise level. So out at 100 AU, we should be able to find some dwarf planets. And then here you see just what, if you take an Earth radius that's 30 Kelvin, here's what it is at three different frequencies. And you see that you could see basically an Earth-sized object out to almost 1,000 AU. And that's pretty cool, right? So I don't know what's out there. 
maybe Planet Nine. So in this scam, Planet Nine is in this in this scheme, Planet Nine is somewhere out there. But you know, who knows what else is out there? Even if Planet Nine's not there, um, you know, now that the sort of Pandora's box has been open, anything could be out there now. So let's go look. So that's something to think about. All right. So um, there's all this stuff, which I haven't talked about, right? That's the CMB. So the CMB propagates through this lumpy universe. So, you know, as photons come through, they get kicked back and forth before they get to us. Um, so to see what that effect looks like, so here is actually the, the you know, you can see right in the center there, you all see Polaris. No, you don't see Polaris. Um, but this is the North Pole. This is Planck. The North Pole is in the middle of that thing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate a gravitational lens in this image. And, um, and you should be able to see where it is. And it's, it, this is an effect that's 20 times larger than the real effect. Anyone know where it is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Lower. there it is. Lower right corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows what's going on. But then the question is, what is it that's funny about this spot? So you have to think about that. Like, what is it that's funny? The mean is the same. The mean is zero. So it's not like there's more flux coming from that spot. So what is it that's funny about this spot? It's the spot sizes are too big, right? So they're too big right here, which is to say the typical angular power spectrum is skewed towards large scales. That's the formal way to put that. Um, and also, it's anisotropic, that the things here are distorted elliptically. But they're distorted elliptically the same in the blue things as in the red things. And so what that's saying is that they have a quadrupole moment, which is another, which is again. So this is saying that the power spectrum is wrong. This is saying it has a quadrupole. Both of those are second or you know squared things, right? Um, so it's it's not something that you're going to pick out with any first order effect, but instead it's a quadratic estimator. So the way to go after looking for this is you want to build some estimator that says I want to find spots where the power spectrum either has the wrong typical uh, size, which is to say peaks at the wrong L's, or somewhere where the power spectrum is anisotropic just to say it's distorted in this radial direction. And so, um, and so that's how you <coughs> measure CMB lensing, is you just look for spots in the sky that are weird, and you say, oh, there must be a mass there. Yep. So what about the ripples? Are those detectable by some sort of two-point correlation function? These, these were, you mean the fact? Like the circular ripples. That are yeah, so these yeah. circular ripples are coming from um, the anisotropy now. And so that's a basically the shear. So what you're seeing right here is, the, is basically shear. And what you're seeing here is convergence. And so what you can tell if you look at these for long enough is that there's a big mass that's right here. And then you're seeing the shear around it. So, uh, so what you want to do is you want to build an estimator that's sensitive to both. So, and so you can write down what the formally optimal estimator is and go, and that's what people do. So you build one of these estimators to go looking for one of those things. So it involves higher order non-Gaussian mode coupling. And you can make a map. So here are the... Um, at least published, these are the lensing maps. So here's, uh, so Planck did it over the whole sky. And this is a map of the gravitational potential in every direction on the entire sky, right? So you want to know how much mass is over there. So you want to build your horoscope, how much mass is over there. Um, go look it up in the Planck map, and they'll tell you how much mass is there. Um, and so the signal noise in this map is such that, you know, these, the bright splotches, splotches are real, but some of the other ones aren't. The signal noise is a word or sort of not quite one. So a five sigma peak is probably real, but a one sig you know, two sigma peak is probably, you know, probably not. Um, so with SBTSZ, we did it over 2,500 square degrees. So with SBT pole, there's, this is only over 100 square degrees. And all these spots are real. So this is now like a real map of the gravitational. So this is kappa in this case. You know, that's a real mass over density. That's an under density. And these are sort of few percent. So those exist now, and there's lots of things you can do with them. Um, so CMB lensing, remember, it's everything between us and the CMB. And you say, what stuff is that sensitive to? Well, here's kind of the, it, you know, if you want to put it in units that are comparable to DNDZ, so the sort of a number density of galaxies, this is, these are two possible galaxy surveys. So this is what LSST, this would be Euclid, one particular sample. 
And CMB lensing, you see, is, is peaking to this, you know, it's more sensitive to structure out here within the range of two and beyond. That's where it starts to really pick up its sensitivity. But you also see that there's plenty of support that even stuff at a redshift of a half is still actually contributing something to the CMB lensing. So it's just one, one integrated slab of mass where it's kind of tapered, so you're not very sensitive to the things right in front of your face, and you're not very sensitive to the stuff at redshift 500. But you are very sensitive to the stuff sort of between a redshift of just past a half out to reionization. So, um, so there's lots of things you can do with this. So one thing you can do is you can cross-correlate with galaxy samples. You can cross-correlate with the cosmic infrared background. So um, the background here is a CMB convergence map with SPT. The color, scale, the color contours are the intensity of the cosmic infrared background. And you can see there's this very interesting giant hole in both the cosmic infrared background and in the lensing. And so this tells you this is a fairly substantial underdensity. It's something like a you know, four or five percent hole in the sky <laughs> extending almost out to the cosmic microwave background. And so as far as I know, no one's actually looked to see what else is going on there. Um, but it's clearly an interesting void. Who knows what's going on? So you can do lots of comparisons. Uh, so what this is, so this is the kids survey, 450. So this is an optical shear survey. So this is what you should read this to be. This is an optical shear survey, so it's just measuring the distortion of galaxies. Um, and they do it in three different bins. So they have a low redshift bin, an intermediate redshift bin, and what they would call a high redshift bin. And then here are the cross correlations between these bins. But um, the reason I'm showing you this is because you see these lines right here? These are the lines that show their noise. And so I picked these because these are some of the only plots of cosmic shear that actually show what their noise is. And so you see signal and noise signal and noise, signal and noise. And you see they're crossing out here at L of about, you know, maybe 90 or something or 100 for this one. Here they're at L of about a, not even 100. So typically they're crossing around L of 100, which is to say um, if you look at one of these mass maps that comes out of one of the, the uh, best shear surveys that's around, um, they, by L of 100, they're noise dominated which is to say on scales of about a degree, um, anything smaller scale than that is mainly noise. So they actually are making a good map on scales of a degree. Beyond that, it's just a statistical test, which is a very interesting one. Sorry, so what are they plotting? This is the, the E-mode shear power spectrum. So this is a measurement of the, um, basically of the projected mass density out to some uh, redshift. So they're doing some sort of filtering at that noise level that's allowing them to make some measurements as two orders of magnitude below. Oh, you mean how are, they, yeah. how are they doing this? Like there's all these points, that most of their plot is points that are below the noise level. Yeah, so. That's what I'm just trying to understand right. what that is. So this is because um, you can measure a power spectrum even when you're mainly dominated by noise, just in the, because it, if you know how much your noise is, you can subtract it out okay, so to some a, precision. Right. And so your precision on subtracting it out is just set by how well characterized your noise is. And that's just set by how many samples you have. So there's some, uh, there's a factor. It's basically, it's related to the number of modes you've measured. And so this says that they measured enough modes to go sort of a factor of 100 lower. So that means they have 10 to the 4 modes or something like that. And so mm -hmm. that helps them get average what's, that down. What's the dominant noise color? It's just because galaxies have some intrinsic, um, it, okay, so it's just, it's just the shape noise. Okay. So this is just the shape noise and the fact that ga they're measuring cosmic sh the average shape of galaxies, and galaxies have some intrinsic dispersion in their, sh in their shapes. So here's the same plot with the South Pole Telescope. So this is, we didn't put the error bars on here, but this is just showing our noise versus the signal for the CMB lensing. And again, you see we're crossing, so we cross at about L of 200. So that, that mass map I showed you with SPT pool that I said those are all real, that's actually a, a more reliable mass map than is currently than can currently be done with cosmic shear. But they're close. So it's it's sort of an interesting convergence that well, convergence, sorry, for doing that. Um, it's this interesting uh, complementarity that completely by accident, um, the CMB lensing map is roughly the same signal to noise as a cosmic shear map 
of the more local universe, which means you can actually put these together and do something interesting. Um, so that's where it is now. And so, you know, the cosmologists, you go to omega, you do contour plots on parameters. So there's sigma eight versus omega matter. And so this is one of the places where there's currently some, um, you know, some tension. So CMB lensing contours are sort of these ones over here. These are different CMB lensing contours. This is what Planck on its own, so not from the lensing map from Planck, but just from the bumps and wiggles in the acoustic peaks, says that sigma 8 is 0.82 or 0.81, when omega matter is just a little bit bigger than 0.3. Now, if you do the same thing with these lensing, with the shear survey, so KIDS 450 is the one I showed, but there's other ones, they give you this family of curves in here. And then people are currently arguing over whether these curves agree with that dot. And whether that's an interesting argument, you can decide for yourself. Um, but the point of showing this is just that these cosmic shear surveys, the, the area of these contours is very similar to that lensing contour. So the constraining power on cosmology from CMB lensing is suspiciously close to the uh, constraining power from cosmic shear. And what's crazy is that this is going to continue. So here's the same kind of plot, except so here it is, the galaxy lensing power spectrum versus L for three different bins. And this is for LSST. So this is LSST level noise. And the bins have been chosen so that the shot noise is basically the same in all the bins. So here's the noise that's projected for these galaxy samples. And you see they're crossing out here L roughly 1,000, <coughs> which is to say that LSST is going to be able to make kind of roughly three mass maps that have a sensitivity where they crap out at L of about 1,000. So L of about 1,000 is um, probably about 10 arc minutes, something like that. So on 10 arc minute scales and, and bigger, um, LSST will be able to make a map of the sky where you can actually figure out how much mass there is in, all, um, in a few different redshift bins, something like three. With the next generation CMB stuff, CMBS4, um, here is where we expect to be able to get to. And so here's where, you know, basically, this is effectively where we are. That's effectively Planck. Well, it's effectively where we are right now just with, with um, polarization. But when you include temperature, we get in here. <coughs> where we're getting to get to is out here. And lo and behold, the crossover is almost exactly the same, which is to say the CMB lensing maps are going to be, in the future, effectively almost exactly as reliable as the um, mass maps coming from LSST. And again, it's, there's no reason for this. It's just, so they're highly complementary now, and they will continue to be highly complementary even into the next generation. So it's some interesting uh, confluence. Will, will their sensitivity to sigma 8 and omega matter, the orientation of the contours be the same? For example, the mass maps being more degenerate in sigma 8? Yeah, so you can see that they're already kind of different, right? So the CMB lensing ones are a little bit tilted compared to the That's shear ones. That's what I mean. That's and the these shear ones are also a little bit different because they have different effective depths, like DES is a little bit shallower than this kit survey. Um, so it's definitely true that that will, but the main thing is, is that these things are, um, you know, so if you're going to 10 times smaller scales, you get um, 100 times more modes. So you're going to be a, just off the top. You're already going to be ten times more sensitive, even for the same sky cover. So then there's going to be more sky. So the contours in both of these are going to get. Um, I mean, I have the the forecast on my laptop, but you know the contours for both of these are going to be probably twenty times smaller than they are now in the future. So you know whether you know this, what's going on here will be resolved shortly. And you know, maybe it's a disagreement, maybe it's not, who knows. But. All right, and just in case you thought that I'm actually quitting cosmology, I'm not. Um, I am, and so there is also the cosmic microwave background. So, you know, here is, you know, these are current measurements of the microwave background. And you would say, well, that's weird. How do you actually shade it with all these colors? Well, I shaded it with all these colors by just putting all the experiments on top of each other. So what you see is that the temperature is extremely well measured all the way out to L, you know, 4,000 and beyond. Um, here are the E modes. So 
the polarization, demode polarization, and you see that's pretty well measured. And then going forward, it's going to get much, much better. This is, these are the projected error bars for SVGTG. Um, and here are, the lens, here are the B modes. And these are only from gravitational lensing. This is not the stuff from the primordial gravitational waves. Um, that's just saying you start with some E mode pattern at last scattering. It gets distorted by lensing. Remember those rays propagating through. Well, those give you these lensing polarization B modes. You see we're going to measure those extremely well. Here are the current measurements. Um, and so there's lots of things we can do with power spectrum that look like this. And you know, just to give you, a, so what I'm currently working towards is I'm working on um, how we can combine the SPT 3G. So that's these projections. How I can combine these with these blue points. So these blue points are the points from bicep kick. So those are the leaders in the field in terms of depth on large angle polarization. Um, by combining the the bicep 3G. With SPT, <coughs> we have the sensitivity of the tensor modes from inflation, and so if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. It's only one slide. Um, you know, so if, if if you don't combine with SPT, you know, once you get below about an R of 0.01, bicep saturates because they just start imaging these B modes better and better and better. You combine with SPT, and you can actually get down a factor of several deeper, um, and really start to clean out all these B modes and look for these inflationary ones. Um, so there's another version. So there's all sorts of other things you can do. So that you know, as, as uh, there is a lot of tension right now in terms of what H mode is, um, and where a lot of that tension is coming from is whenever anything touches uh, something to do with the acoustic scale, and you see the the scale that's very clear. Um, well, that's what shows up in the galaxy distribution is baryon acoustic oscillations, and so anything that actually is using this acoustic scale as a ruler. Um, Immediately drives you to a low to a lower H mode, you know, 67, 68. The nearby measurements are that it's something like 72 or 73, um, and there's a real question about where that tension is coming from. Is it something that's a little funny in the CMB, or is it something that's funny in the local measurements? Who knows? Um, so one way to get at that is to just make more careful measurements of these acoustic groups. So Planck sort of once you get to L of about 2,000 in the temperature is where their error bars blow up. Um, you even see right here in their, in their E modes, so these are the polarization E modes, you see the Planck actually um, gets pretty, starts to get pretty noisy once you get out here. You can actually see their error bars, if you can believe that. How awful to be able to see someone's error bars, how embarrassing. Um, <coughs> and so with, you know, with the current generation, ACT poll and SVT poll, you can see that we went out a little bit further and now you're seeing SVT's error bars. Um, with 3G, we'll go out much further before our error bars show. Um, and so you see this is, a, you know, it's more than a factor of two in L where we're going to be actually getting good measurements of this CMB power spectrum. So, um, and so with ACTPOL and with 3G, we should be able to nail down these acoustic peaks and figure out whether, you know, maybe it's just something funny in here in the Planck data. Maybe Planck just has, maybe something funny is going on in there the place to look is out here and say, well, does the acoustic scale down here agree with the acoustic scale out here? That might shed some light on the H-mode tension. Um, we can also measure whether there are any light species, so ineffective is sort of whether there are any um, anything that looks like extra neutrinos in the universe. Um, dark matter interactions show up in the CMB at this level of precision. Uh, neutrino physics, it turns out if neutrinos, you know, the standard model is that neutrinos kind of decouple and then free stream, but if neutrinos interact with themselves, then they don't actually just expand freely with each other, they actually have a different sound speed. That sound speed would show up as a slight sh phase shift in these acoustic peaks. Um, and then, you know, gravitational waves, you know, using the universe as a gravitational wave detector. <laughs> All right, so, um, I hope what I meant to convince you is that what, what are called CMB surveys are actually um, more than just CMB surveys. So they are CMB surveys, and that's great. Um, but there's lots of other things to do. And so if people have ideas for other things to do with really deep uh, microwave maps that are repeated on a kind of daily cadence, uh, please let me know. That's it. And if you want to consider horoscopes for masses as a second career, also let me know. Yeah, absolutely.
Wow, very nice. Um, I hadn't thought you could do all that much. Um, you, you were talking about uh, B modes and bicep, and that uh, hasn't, uh, you avoided the, the, the big thing in the room of their, the, the, that bicep announcement. I, I haven't heard the fallout from that bicep announcement. Maybe in this particular, people got have been pushing like mad and have been doing much better uh, in the last few years than was in the original bicep announcement. I haven't heard, it, well, maybe you might know, but that's why I'm asking, uh, that whether there's been any discovery or limits. Be because if they haven't found it by now, that, that really means that that's telling you something already. Uh, what, what can you tell me? Yeah, so, um, so the original bicep announcement was, I mean, you can even see it a little bit. Let's see, is that right? Well, we can see it right here. So here are their points. These are the bicep points. Um, and so this is cut off right here. So this is where, and what they measured was basically a couple points that are that were off this curve, that low, very low out. Um, and so they, you know, tr you know, were a little fooled by what they thought the dust should be, and they thought they discovered primordial gravitational waves. And instead, what they discovered is that um, galactic dust is really highly polarized if you look out through extremely empty bits of the galaxy. Um, and so once that was realized, it was like, okay, well, I guess we need to measure the dust better. And so what they've since been doing is um, effectively expand, massively expanding their coverage at other frequencies. And so, you know, that plot I showed you know, at the very beginning showing how low they were, that was just in that original channel. And what they've since been doing is they've expanded to other frequencies at 90 gigahertz in particular and at 220 to push down to a similar sensitivity in these other frequencies to see you know, what the spectral dependence is, to see whether, um, you know, what's dust and what's synchrotron. And so the most recent effort they have is their limit is now lower than it was before by, you know, so after they corrected their mistake, they then had an upper limit on R. Um, so they've now pushed down almost a factor of two on that, on that upper limit. But now they have it, they have multiple frequencies where they can say, well, and we know that there's an upper limit, you know, we've measured this much dust. So they've actually now, you know, they measured the dust the first time. Now they've measured it at multiple frequencies and dust has a rising spectrum. And so they can actually have managed to reliably be able to say there's the dust at 220 gigahertz. And they're seeing, they're now seeing if they can see any synchrotron emission. So it's a sort of dual, they're pushing down at now saying, just trying to get broad coverage over a bunch of different frequencies and push down. And then say, well, uh, what we're looking for is something that has a CMB spectrum. Because if it has a CMB spectrum, it's pro that's probably what it is. And so, you know, it's, you would have thought that's given time for other people to catch up. Uh, but it turns out it's a really hard measurement. So, uh, you know, the, the unit they use, remember I was saying Milijansky is a real unit. The unit they use is nanokelvin. The, the, their unit of, their u so we talk about micro K arc minute because we're sort of, you know, arc minute resolution. They talk about nanokelvin degrees. It's just, it's, the sensitivity is insane and no one has gotten there yet. So SPT, we can't get, you know, I mean, there's no, nothing saying that we can't get there. It's just empirically we haven't on these large scales. And so, you know, we can't beat them, so we're joining them. Thank you. Uh, so Gil, I appreciate you mentioning planets, so I'll reward you with a planet question. But it's, uh, a <laughs> an, it's an endoplanet, not an exoplanet. <laughs> yeah. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so I uh, know, because I, I checked quickly, so for the Earth, it's about 50% of the heat is radiogenic and 50% is the primordial heat of formation. Oh, yeah. It's basically GMM over R released over time. Yeah. So you'd expect for something more massive, it would be dominated by the primordial heat. Yes. For, I don't know, is that something you get yeah. considered, or could it be even brighter than you um, Yeah, it definitely could be brighter. Yeah. And on top of that, it could have an atmosphere on top of it. So this is just, so that thing that I showed is just assuming it's a rock. Yeah. And if you put an atmosphere, so if you did the same thing for Neptune, Neptune would actually be twice as bright as I, as I would have put it on the plot, because you're seeing some depth into the atmosphere in the millimeter. Um, so it, it could be brighter, for sure. If I can ask another question, it, 
Um, when you say that there's a 1% chance of something that lasts for several, being, you know, a chance, you know, a fluke, yeah. that lasts for several days and covers many pixels and yeah. has a leak. Well, it's only one pixel. It's only one pixel. Oh, it looked like it was bleeding. Okay, that was No, just, that's just the oh, beam. Okay. Yeah, it's only one okay. pixel. But still, um, it's a fair question. Like, yeah. it lasted several days. It has this perfect light curve that you plot the light curve, it goes up and it comes down. But you then say, well, we looked for things that went up and came down. And then you say, how many pixels did you look at? And you just kind of say, well, how often should we have seen something that looked this good? It turns out to be 1% over all possible orientations. Like, you know, you know, in 100 versions of our universe, how often did someone find something that wasn't there? It's one in 100. Usually that doesn't stop theorists from speculating. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, what, what? I mean, are there? there somebody must have. There must be papers in the archive about crazy theories for millimeters. You know, so, millimeters, like so when we published the paper, we kind of looked at it and said, "Boy, this is, you know, one percent is kind of a number that." Um, so we published it as a, "Hey, here's here's a candidate," is what we called it. We didn't call it an event. And that's just because, you know, we're a pretty conservative group, like the biceps, you know, biceps, <laughs> biceps stuck their neck out, right? <laughs> and look what happened to them. Um, so no one has really come up with something that it could be. But I think only because there's not very many bits of information. There's a time scale, and then it had some linear polarization that flipped. But it didn't look. It doesn't look like a classic GRB of any kind. Like I think if it had looked exactly like a GRB, people would have been really excited. Like, oh, you detected a GRB. But because it doesn't look like a GRB, there's kind of an attitude of, well, that's funny. But less information, the easier it is to come. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. With no information at all, it'd be really easy to yeah. do that, right? Um, but you know, I think the lesson is that there's stuff up there, and you know, we just need to get better at. You know, the, the first thing to do is we need to get a real-time pipeline where we can just say, when it comes off the telescope, post it on ATEL and say, anyone else see anything funny here? And see what happens. I have a question about the sigma A versus uh, omega nida flux that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, were you fixing any of the other cosmological parameters, for example, or were you just doing a full parameter estimation on all cosmological parameters to show us so yeah, this, so this, if you just allow everything to vary, like really, really vary, like if you mat, if you mat let omega b be equal to omega matter or things like that, then it really screws everything up. And so there, so for this particular plot, so this, you know, this is the, you know, the CMB as a whole. These other plots allow things to vary sort of over the range of what seemed like reasonable parameters 10, 15 years ago. You know, saying that omega bh squared is roughly within a factor of two or so allowed by Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. That the spectral index, I think we had NS going from like 0.9 to 1 or something like that. You know, it's kind of very modest priors just to stop things from going crazy. Um, but this is mainly, you know, it, it's, um, you know, the, the priors are weak enough that it's, as long as you are keeping into what we think is a reasonable facsimile of our universe, um, these are quasi-independent measurements of omega matter, so they're, they aren't using very much CMB information, but they're, you know, they're using the fact that we know something about our universe, but not the full info that we think is there. Other questions? Uh, you mentioned a fair amount of uh, Iggy and Blazars in these surveys. Uh, just out of curiosity, what's the highest Z things that you've been able to see with this so far? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> like seriously, no one, no one looks at them. I don't, and you know, it's because blazers are messy. I mean, you know, they fluctuate all over the place, and so now, you know, so now that they fluctuate and neutrinos come from them, people are super interested in them, <laughs> um, or neutrino, I guess. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I don't know. I have no idea what the highest Z one would be. But it's you know it's whatever blazars go out to. Like they're out of redshift one and things like that. But they're not redshift ten. So 
Okay. Well, we are going to please go out to dinner. So if you're interested in joining and you haven't let me know yet, please do so. And let's sing to my dance.